In this lesson, we're going to look at the League of Nations in the 1920s, and we're going to ask how successful was the League of Nations during that time. We'll start with looking at the activities of some of the commissions of the League of Nations, and the first one we're going to look at is the Refugees Commission. The gentleman you can see on the right is Dr. Fritjof Nansen. He's actually a bit of a superhero. He was a polar explorer in his younger days, and he became the leader of the Refugees Commission for the, for the um, League of Nations. This was a success story. Uh, there were half a million prisoners of war left over in Russia, and the Refugees Commission arranged for them to be returned to their homes. Furthermore, there was chaos and homelessness and refugees in, in Turkey after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and camps were set up to look after Turkish refugees. So, big successes for the Refugees Commission. Something else that was associated with the League of Nations was the International Labour Organization, the ILO, which, remember, actually still exists today. This had some successes and, and some, well, not exactly failures. It didn't achieve all of the things that it wanted. But you have to remember, again, this was the first attempt at an international organization, and it had to deal with the self-interest of countries. So it tried to improve working conditions around the world, a success for the ILO is it persuaded a lot of countries to set up free job centres for the unemployed, which was a significant thing. It didn't really help later on in the 1930s, as we see in the Great Depression, because there simply weren't any jobs to go around. But to have free job centres was a good thing. It was progress. It succeeded in making the workplace safer by banning dangerous and poisonous white lead in paint. In fact, the only large country, a large Western country that continued to have lead in paint was the United States. It tried to implement, and it didn't succeed in this, there was too much opposition from countries worried about how their industrial progress would be affected. It did try to start a maximum 48 hour week. It wasn't successful in that respect. But again, it did have some success with minimum wages. A convention was established in 77 countries on minimum wages. So some successes and some areas where it didn't succeed for the ILO. The health organization was a significant success story. Um, it was trying to eradicate diseases as much as possible and promote good health, especially in poorer countries. This picture actually here is actually an American man uh, with leprosy, uh, a, hor a horrifying disease. And the League, the health organization rather, uh, one of the commissions of the League of Nations, it did succeed in reducing leprosy and malaria around the world significantly. So another success for the League. The Slavery Commission was a, yet another notable success for the League of Nations. Uh, 200,000 slaves were freed in Sierra Leone in West Africa who had been subjected to brutal treatment, as you can see in that picture. Let's have a look at the League of Nations in the 1920s now and look at how successful was it politically in helping sort out disputes and problems between countries. We're going to look at, I think, five altogether. <laughs> it might be five or six. We're going to look at a few problems here. The Ireland Islands in the 1920, which is this dispute between Sweden and Finland. In the same year, Vilna, dispute between Lithuania and Poland. In 1921, an area called Upper Silesia, which was disputed between Germany and Poland. In 1922, the Austrian and Hungarian economies were rescued by the League of Nations. In 1923, Corfu, an, a Greek island off the coast of Greece, uh, there was a problem there between Italy and Greece, which we're going to look at in a moment. And in 1925, there was the Greek-Bulgarian crisis the so-called War of the Stray Dog. <clears throat> so let's look first at the Ireland Islands. You can see in the picture here, the Ireland Islands are very strategically located in between Finland and Sweden. And they were disputed between those two countries. So Sweden and Finland almost came to war, but they asked the League to step in and help out, to come to a decision at which they would accept. And it did do that. The League of Nations said that the Ireland Islands should remain with Finland. There were quite a lot of Swedes living there, but, the, 
but the league ruled that they should remain with Finland, although no military hardware was to be allowed to put on the island, and Sweden accepted this, um, this solution. So the possible conflict was avoided there. So this is a success story for the League of Nations in arbitrating, sorting out disputes between nations, the island islands. Now we have something which is not a success for the League, which is the Vilna crisis. If you look on the map here, it's actually called Vilnius here, it depends what language you're using. Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia were, new, were countries that were re-established after World War I. And Lithuania hoped that Vilnius, which had been the old capital of Lithuania many, many years before, would become the new capital of Lithuania. However, there were a lot of Poles living there, and Polish troops actually invaded and seized Lith uh, Vilnius, so Lithuania couldn't have it. Basically, the Poles took it. Now, the League of Nations did condemn this action, but the Polish troops simply said, well, we don't care, we're staying here. They refused to leave, and the League didn't do anything about it. A possible explanation is that France didn't want to upset Poland because it saw Poland as a potential ally against Germany. So it doesn't want to offend a potential friend here. Upper Silesia was a success story for the League. This happened in 1921. Upper Silesia was a, t a piece of territory um, in between Germany and Poland and it was disputed they both claimed that Upper Silesia should belong to them. The League of Nations, there was actually a plebiscite. Um, here is actually a Polish propaganda poster saying, um, you know, vote for Poland to be free. It says that in, in Polish and in German, actually. So Poland for freedom. Um, there was a plebiscite. It was divided. One third of Upper Silesia actually went to Poland. That sounds like not a lot, but actually that was the richest industrial area, so Poland was quite pleased. Germany was much less pleased, but it did accept the decision of the League of Nations. So Upper Silesia, 1921, a success for the League of Nations. Another success here, this was uh, between 22 and 23. Austria and Hungary, their economies were devastated after World War I and having to pay reparations. Their economies were really ruined and facing absolute bankruptcy. So the League of Nations arranged international loans which rescued the economies of Austria and Hungary, saved them from bankruptcy. So another success for the League of Nations there. Let's have a look now at the Corfu crisis, which the League of Nations, it doesn't look too good when we look at this crisis. It hasn't really handled it that well. Uh, and that, this is the reason why this gentleman here, Mussolini, he's become the fascist leader of Italy. And he knows that Britain and France, remember the council has Britain, France, Italy and Japan as the first four permanent members. And all of those countries contribute money to run and pay for the League of Nations. And Mussolini knows that his contributions are important and the fact he's on the council is important for the League of Nations as well. So what was the Corfu crisis? In 1923, some Italians, including a general, General Tallini, were killed on the Greek side of the Greek-Albanian border. They were working for an organisation called the Conference of Ambassadors, and they were trying to help sort out the Greek and Albanian border. So some Italians are killed in Greece. Mussolini blamed Greece for this and actually started attacking from his ships. He bombed it from his ships, shelled it from his ships, attacked the Greek island of Corfu. So this is clearly an example of a country acting aggressively without a good enough reason really to start attacking and invading another country. But what does the League do about it? Well, as we said, Britain and France, they needed Italy. They needed Italian contributions. And if Italy left the League, it's going to be really compromised. It's going to lose its effectiveness and power because Italy's actually on the Council of League. So they need Italy. They can't come to a decision over the Corfu crisis. So eventually, the whole matter is settled outside the League. The League doesn't come to a conclusion or a decision on this. And Greece is actually forced to pay compensation to Italy, which seems a bit unfair when you remember that Italy actually attacked Greece. So not a shining example of the League handling a crisis well there, the Corfu crisis, a failure for the League of Nations. Let's have a look at something which can be viewed 
largely as a success, but also shows up something, a weakness in the League of Nations. Now, why have we got a picture of a dog here? Well, this little dog, in some ways, helped cause a war. Why? In 1925, the so-called War of the Stray Dog broke out. Basically, what had happened was a Greek soldier chased his dog over the border into Bulgarian territory and was shot by a Bulgarian soldier. The Greeks took this very badly and they actually invaded Bulgaria because of this incident. So Greek troops invaded Bulgaria. The League of Nations stepped in, ordered a ceasefire and ruled in favour of Bulgaria. They said it wasn't sufficient reason for Greece to invade Bulgaria and Greece had to pay compensation or money to Bulgaria, which Greece accepted. So this actually, in many ways, it's a good success for the League of Nations. It stops a war. Both sides have accepted it. But Greece feels a bit annoyed because, in this case, it acted aggressively against Bulgaria because, you know, some of its soldiers have been killed, just like Italy had done earlier. But where Italy got away with it, Greece didn't. So it seems to be one rule for the big powerful countries which the League needs, and the League will probably act more fairly and decisively when it's a dispute which doesn't involve big important countries. So let's have a little look at a summary here. So summary, some notable social successes for the League in health, reducing diseases like malaria and leprosy, slavery, you know, there's 200,000 slaves freed in Sierra Leone, refugees in Russia and in Turkey, some political successes, the Ireland Islands dispute is sorted out, the Greek and Bulgarian crisis is sorted out, the war is stopped, but less successful when bigger countries that leaders of the League of Nations, such as France really and Britain, are worried about losing the support of, such as Poland in, Vil in Vilnius or Vilnius, or Italy with the core food crisis, it's less successful there. So a mixed bag, some successes, some failures for the League of Nations in the 1920s.